Thank you, Kevin. Um, let me just start off by uh, thanking all those who've made this uh, particular report possible. It's been uh, quite an effort. It's involved quite a lot of uh, different groups and researchers. I think firstly to, to uh, DFID for, for providing financial support for the report and to our colleagues uh, at the Met Office, uh, Julia's team and Kirsty Lewis's uh, team over there, uh, for for really um, you know fantastic contributions as uh, you know late at night often uh, to, to to deal with issues of data and things like that. But also uh, to uh, my colleague uh, Robert Muir Wood at uh, Risk Management Solutions uh, for help on the kind of catastrophe modelling side. Um, and to the team here at ODI, um, who really put in a, a real uh, extra shift to, to, to make this report possible. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to introduce you to my colleague Amanda, who's going to be helping me present the report today. Um, we're going to, to do a little bit of a tag team approach. I'm going to present the, the first half and then pass over to Amanda, and then I'll, I'll come back for the conclusions. So, you know, as Kevin said, it, in some ways, it's, it's a kind of interesting timing for this report because it seems to have been one of the most hazardous weeks I can I can think of for some time. We've got Cyclone Pylene obviously in, in India. We have Typhoon um, Whipfa, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this, but currently striking Tokyo, causing havoc. have Typhoon Nari in uh, Vietnam and yesterday uh, an earthquake in the Philippines. I think also, you know, we could probably point to those events in some ways as actually being successes. Um, not in terms of the number of people that they're affecting, but in the number of people uh, uh, impacted. But actually, the loss of life from these events has been um, relatively small. And so, you know, I think it, they're an indication, or one indication, that there clearly is some uh, progress in disaster preparedness, and we're doing a much better job in uh, saving lives. I think what this report does, though, is also highlight that if we're serious about ending extreme poverty, we've got to look beyond saving just lives. We need to look also at livelihoods. We need to look at poor people's outcomes in these, in these instances. So let me just take you through some of the motivations for this report uh, and to highlight some of our key findings before going a little bit behind some of those headlines. So this report really emerged from the discussions around the UN Secretary General's high-level panel report on post-2015 development goals. And I think uh, we saw in that particular report that uh, the Prime Minister Cameron and the presidents of Liberia and Indonesia uh, recommended for there to be a headline goal on ending poverty, so ending extreme poverty by 2030. <coughs> and within that goal, uh, there is clearly under their, under target D, a target around building resilience and reducing deaths from natural disasters. Um, and so we set out thinking, well, do disasters really pose a threat to the goal of ending poverty? What is that threat? Uh, how significant is it? And, and what can we say about its, its geographical distribution? What, is there a geography behind this particular uh, uh, intersection? And Really, the report comes up with a resounding answer to say, you know, yes, disasters do pose a threat to that goal of ending poverty, particularly if you look at it on a country-by-country -country basis. Um, let me just run through some of the headline figures from the report. So there'll be 325 million extremely poor people living on less than $1.25 a day in the 49 most hazard-prone countries by 2030. If you just take extreme weather events alone, <coughs> there'll be 118 million extremely poor people living in locations mo most exposed to drought, heat and flooding in sub-Saharan Africa. And then really referring to Kevin's figure, if you, if you look to 2030 and we think about this $4 a day limit uh, uh, threshold being some kind of threshold uh, beyond which you might escape uh, the chances of poverty when being hit by disaster, we have 1.5 billion people in 2030 still living at less than $4 a day in the most hazard-prone countries. And so I think we, we can highlight from this report, simply if we don't tackle this threat, the idea of ending extreme poverty by 2030 is, is ludicrous. And all the evidence is at the moment that we're not really making enough progress on the poverty dimensions of disasters. So we started off uh, this report saying, well, do disasters really cause long-term impoverishment? 
you know, there's a lot of, you know, certainly my appreciation of the literature was that there was a lot of different stories around this. Um, in some countries, maybe it, it's not such a factor. In others, uh, it certainly is. So we, we looked at four case studies, um, Bangladesh floods from 1998, Haiti earthquake in 2010, Ethiopia's Great Famine in the early 1980s, and in the Philippines, typhoons Ondoy and Pepeng in 2009. And from the data that's available from those events, it's pretty clear that disasters do have an impoverishing effect. Now, the challenge that we face is that the long-term data sets around these particular events are quite difficult to access and quite difficult to really get the kind of quantitative measures here. But certainly, in the case of the Haiti earthquake, we found that only 16% of poor households had returned to pre-earthquake asset levels and income six months after the earthquake. And in typhoons Ondoy and Pepeng in the Philippines, in the province of Rizal, poverty levels doubled a year after the typhoon had struck. I think we also triangulated that with data from the UN Human Development Report that, that Kevin led on back in 2008, I think it was. Certainly a long time ago. A long time, 2008, um, which really highlighted the long-term nutrition and stunting effects of drought uh, in Africa, highlighting that in uh, children born in drought years are 36% more likely to be malnourished and 41% more likely to be stunted, uh, and that this, these kind of impacts carry on throughout childhood into later life uh, and, and have certain poverty outcomes. But we wanted to go beyond that kind of case study material and start to do a bit more uh, uh, quantitative analysis of some particular household panel data sets to look at this issue in more detail. Let me just quickly run through these. Now, let me just take you through what we've done here. We've, we looked at household panel uh, data from Andhra Pradesh and Ethiopia, looking at the prevalence of shocks for households and trying to understand, in the greater scheme of things, what relative impact do environmental shocks and uh, uh, natural hazards have compared to other shocks on households. And this is the data from Andhra Pradesh, looking uh, at uh, a period through uh, the 2000s, uh, and particularly here, it's very difficult to, to pick out the particular colours, um, but the blue at the bottom, the, the kind of the, the darkish blue, represents the proportions of households citing drought as the major cause of impoverishment, which you can see there in, in some instances, uh, you've got 40% you know, of households reporting that, compared to other aspects, um, uh, certainly more predominant. And then the same from... Uh, Ethiopia. And certainly on the left-hand side you have uh, a period earlier on where over a number of household panel sets you're seeing drought as a predominant factor. Now this represents only a small sample of course and this needs more work to try and bottom out that relative impact but in these particular cases we can highlight that uh, drought is a key cause of impoverishment uh, in, in certainly those kind of drought prone areas. And then uh, what we do, let me just flick back, what we do in the report is try to highlight a set of factors that we think are key causes or reasons for being susceptible to disaster-induced impoverishment. Certainly living in a rural area, and a remote rural area seems to be an important factor. Lack of access to markets, lack of access to financial credit, no adequate coverage by social safety nets, and particularly in the post-disaster situation, no access to employment or, or uh, uh, income in those settings. Now, in terms of how we approached this report, um, Kevin pointed to the fact this was kind of combinations of modelling. Um, what we wanted to do to really understand 2030 was to look at the poverty dynamics. What can we say about poverty and the geography of poverty in 2030? Um, what can we say about the geography of natural hazards and natural hazard exposure in 2030, given the impacts of climate change? Mm -hmm. And for those of you uh, familiar with climate models, we used uh, the RCP 4.5, um, which predicts 1.7 degrees C of temperature increase from the pre-industrial levels to 2050. Um, the 
thing to point out here is that this is not an extreme scenario. This is a kind of a middle range model uh, in terms of its appreciation of climate change. So we're in no way being alarmist here with the with the outcomes. And then we combine, so we combine the climate work, work on uh, catastrophe risk, uh, model uh, poverty models with an appreciation of the quality of disaster risk management in countries and adaptive capacity. And I want to just take you through a couple of those findings on uh, on extreme weather and on disaster risk management before handing over to Amanda. So here is uh, a map showing a change in global drought hazard <coughs> indicator between the historic period at the end of the 20th century and in the 2030s. And here you can see that the darker red areas represent a drying of uh, dry periods within any one year. And so um, from the current baseline, <coughs> the red marks uh, highlight where drought is expected to become more severe. And so you can see that there's a real concentration in the Amazon basin, concentration in southern Africa, a belt across northern India and southeast Asia, and then interestingly also Japan, Mexico, and southern Europe. Um, which, uh, you know, that's the areas where we're expecting increased uh, severity, but it's also worth highlighting areas where we're not uh, uh, necessarily predicting quite such in increased severity on this measure. <coughs> that's in parts of the Sahel and in the Horn of Africa, largely because the period in the late 20th century was a particularly dry period for the Sahel and the Horn of Africa. Um, this is not to say that all of a sudden there's going to be no drought in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa. Um, uh, it certainly may do. And what we need to do is understand much more about the interannual dynamics, the seasonal dynamics, when rain starts, when rain stops, and things like that. And this particular measure doesn't pick up those kinds of uh, specificities. Then we also looked at a multi-hazard indicator. And this multi-hazard indicator looks at the exposure in 2030 to drought, floods, extremes of temperature, tropical cyclones, and earthquakes. And this, for those who've worked on uh, disasters for some time, is a fairly familiar map. You will not necessarily see a grand departure from the, the types of maps that colleagues at UNISDR have produced as part of the Global Assessment Report. And so what we can say is that the type of uh, distribution that we have at the moment of exposure to hazards holds fairly well until 2030s, except for a few small patches, and I want to just pick up those. This map represents the change in that multi-hazard indicator to the 2030s. And so here, what we're particularly looking at is not changes in earthquake. We're not <coughs> going to get changes in the distribution of earthquakes in this period. Um, we're also not able to look particularly at the changes in distribution of tropical cyclones. We haven't got uh, enough data quite to, to highlight those kind of aspects, and it may be that they're not particularly changing. But it does highlight changes in extremes of heat, extremes of rainfall, and drought. So you can again pick out there some similar areas in, in kind of southern part of Brazil, a band across southern Africa, uh, a, a northern India, Nepal, and, and some parts of Southeast Asia. And what we're also <coughs> able to do is zoom in a little bit and to look at a more uh, regional basis uh, at some of these variations. And here we pick out some aspects that Amanda's going to talk about later in terms of some of the regional focus of concern. Uh, you can see, particularly in South Asia and in Madagascar, that we really see very high levels of, of hazard exposure across this multi-hazard index. In East Africa, I think some of the some of the dynamics are a little bit different. We have to take a bit more care at looking at some of those. And but remembering also partly because uh, there may be less exposure to earthquakes and tropical cyclones in some parts of Africa, which, which change some of this dynamic. I want to go on just to think about disaster risk management capacity. You know, what we were clear about in the report is that you know, a really effective national disaster risk management system and the ability to really be flexible and forward-looking in terms of your decision-making and to invest in, in reducing <coughs> risk into the future makes a big difference. And certainly the kind of risk reduction that focuses on the poorest people makes a big difference. Um, and in this <coughs> index, we're trying to create a categorization of countries which at the top 
uh, certainly in countries of concern, have the best disaster risk management and at the bottom uh, have, have the poorest risk management and adaptive capacity. And so we, we uh, overlay this in, in, in later on in the report to look at which particular countries have inadequate capacity to deal with this kind of exposure. Let me just pick out a few there. At the top, you'll see some of the usual suspects of Colombia, Indonesia, Mexico, Rwanda, uh, interestingly there, Thailand, Vietnam, um, and at the bottom, really some of the most fragile states. Now, in the, we've created this index by combining uh, data from the World Risks Index, data from the Gain Readiness Index, and reports uh, through the HFA monitor, the Hugo Framework for Action monitor. What we would say is that overall the quality of data about national capacity for disaster risk management isn't as good as it could be. And I think we need to work harder to really understand that, but this data set certainly gives us a good indication. And then if you look at this mapped across the world, uh, again, probably fairly familiar type of distribution here, with the green colours showing the best uh, adaptive capacity and disaster risk management, and the red colours showing showing the worst. Uh, and you'll see you know, interesting concentrations again in in Sudan and Chad and the belt across sub-Saharan Africa, and then in in uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan areas. We also wanted to think a little bit harder about subnational contexts, um, which proved really difficult in terms of getting availability of data. Um, to actually begin to understand provincial or state level uh, adaptive capacity and disaster risk management quality was tough. Uh, we developed a fairly rudimentary index where data was available and just in this particular instance applied it to India. Um, the reason we applied it to India is because there's such great numbers of people uh, in India and based on our understanding there's really very significant differences in the capacity of state level to deal with different hazards in India we thought it was important to take India on a state by state basis and that you will see in the report when we overlay all our data sets we highlight a set of states in India that we c that we can see as particular concern um, very interesting in the in the case of uh, uh, cyclone pylene that th this one of the states that we highlight is Odisha. Now, in Odisha, I think we've highlighted that there's, you know, through, through the experience in the last few days, that there's really good uh, experience of preparedness from tropical cyclones in Odisha. But in this particular instance, we're highlighting concerns about the threat to long-term impoverishment in Odisha caused by a cyclone like this. Certainly some of the news reports that are coming out about the number of people still being affected and flooding and dislocation from homes and damage to shelters, it's going to take some time for us to really understand that. But this report is making a prediction that we should be concerned about the impoverishment impacts. And uh, let me pass over now at this point to Amanda, who's going to take you through some of our poverty <coughs> modeling work. Sure, thanks, Tom. Um, so what I'll uh, aim to cover today is two aspects of the report that we've covered. Uh, one is to look at the poverty proje projections that we've analyzed. Um, and I'll also um, take a step in looking at the combination of factors, so looking at uh, tying in uh, poverty, uh, exposure to climate and disaster extremes, as well as the, um, the adaptive capacity of particular countries and overlay those um, in the analysis. So in this study, um, uh, looking at the uh, poverty projections, we've looked at both um, the projections of poverty and also the implications <coughs> of increased exposure to climate uh, extremes at three uh, levels. We've explored potential impacts at the household level, as we've briefly touched on, as Tom's briefly touched on. Uh, we've also attempted to look at some subnational analyses of poverty. Um, and then, of course, we've looked at uh, global projections and attempted to highlight particular geographical regions of concern. On the first two, um, as Tom's mentioned, um, on household level impacts and household poverty projections and also subnational uh, data constraints mean that um, this has only been possible for a handful of countries and we've narrowed in on a couple in this analysis. Um, and um, what I'll be discussing today for the most part are the uh, international projections and focusing in on particular geographical regions. Um, but be turning, before turning to the international figures, I think it's worth uh, revisiting some of the findings um, on um, exposure to environmental hazards and drought in particular um, and how these uh, impact uh, poverty reduction efforts both in terms of 
uh, the potential for people to uh, slip into poverty and also preventing people from escaping poverty. Um, and so the table that I have here, um, it highlights the fact um, um, of the, the takeaway message is, is that um, impoverishment trends can easily cancel out escapes from poverty in particular countries. Um, so what this table provides is an overview of, of findings from various uh, published studies on the poverty dynamics in particular countries based on panel data. And this is where observations have been made on both the escapes and slips into poverty. And although we can't compare, uh, in particular, the absolute figures across these countries because they're based on different surveys and different time periods, what we do see is that in many cases, the number of people escaping poverty um, in any given time period can actually be cancelled out by the number of people slipping into poverty. So this takes us now into um, some of the, the projections that we've developed for this report. And what we've relied on mainly is the international futures model, in particular the baseline poverty projections. And this is a, a large-scale, long-term data modeling system which has been developed uh, by Barry Hughes and colleagues at the Frederick Parity Center for International Futures at the University of Denver. And what it contains is a, is a regularly updated and internationally representative uh, data source on demographics, uh, economic uh, indicators, energy, agriculture, and sociopolitical uh, subsystems for 183 countries. Um, and <coughs> some of these data series go back as far as 1960. And the model is derived from the interaction of approximately 1,500 variables, um, and is thus n not only looking at population and uh, demographic trends, but as, and as well as economic projections um, and income distribution, but it also looks at some of these other uh, potential drivers of poverty looking forward to 2030, which include governance indicators and human development indicators. So in order to, um, to develop um, our projections, we've, as I've mentioned, we've mainly relied on the baseline projections developed in this model, which is an interaction of these 1,500 variables. Um, the key difference between the projections that we've produced in this report and those perhaps of other studies um, is primarily, I think, the complexity of the model um, using, using this uh, wide array of variables and also the fact that it allows us, as, ma as many studies also do, um, to develop um, different scenarios of what poverty might look like in 2030 based on particular drivers that we've identified um, as particularly relevant. So that's going beyond um, income distribution and, and economic growth. So in this report, we've explored three particular scenarios, uh, the baseline scenario, an optimistic scenario, and a, and, a and a pessimistic scenario. And these scenarios are developed by um, selecting key drivers of poverty, and in this case, we've also added uh, disaster resilience to add to the, um, the complexity of the, of the observations. Um, and so the optimistic scenario uh, is developed by selecting a particular list of parameters, which I'm highlighting here, um, and basically providing a positive um, multiplier to each of these drivers, suggesting that looking forward, if each of these indicators, which include agricultural productivity, total fertility rate, um, total factor productivity, um, if these were to go better than expected based on historical data, what would our um, projections for poverty look like? Alternatively, um, using a pessimistic scenario um, by applying a negative multiplier um, to these uh, parameters, we can look at if situations were to worsen across particular countries, what would our absolute numbers and in individual countries, what would those uh, numbers in, in poverty look like moving forward. So turning to some of our, um, our headline results and what we've, um, what we've been able to arrive at. Um, just looking at a very broad level um, and the categories of countries that we're seeing in 2030 most um, at risk of high numbers and proportions of poverty, um, we see that extreme poverty, which uh, measured at um, $1.25 a day, um, will be evenly split between uh, low-income countries and low-middle-income countries. Um, so this highlights um, sort of the, the category of country that we're looking at um, towards 2030 um, and, and where the numbers of, of people will, will be in those country categories. Perhaps something to, to highlight, as, as we've identified India as a special case um, in our analysis, we do see here um, in this first figure on $1.25 a day that India does make up a significant proportion of the, of the low middle income country um, absolute numbers of of people in poverty in 2030. And if we look at um, another 
more extreme measure or, or as we term severe measure of poverty, which would be those people furthest um, or further from the poverty line at 75 cents a day. Now we, see to, we start to see the dynamic of countries shifting in terms of um, country uh, income categorization and we see that um, at the most uh, severe levels, um, low income countries make up a more significant proportion of, of the numbers of, of poor people projected to 2030. And to put this um, sort of into perspective, um, we've, we've developed, based on the absolute numbers that we arrive at from the model, um, we've developed an index, um, which we've called, a, which we've termed a vulnerability to poverty, um, and categorized each country based on this index. And uh, what it does is to look both at the absolute numbers of people in poverty, so the number in millions um, projected to 2030 for each individual country, but also to look at the proportions of people in each individual country projected to, um, for poverty. Um, the rationale behind this being that not only does um, a significant uh, number of people projected in poverty to 2030 pose uh, pose uh, difficulties for governments to respond and to mitigate uh, disasters looking forward, but also that a significant proportion of the population um, composed within, within the country would also potentially present an even greater uh, barrier um, in the face of, of, of uh, managing a disaster. And so here we see, uh, you, can, you can start to see some of the geographical spread, which I'll go into in a bit more detail and pick out some of the countries from this, from this map, but what this is showing is um, based across um, the entire index uh, where we find the, the biggest concentrations of proportions and absolute numbers in poverty. And we <laughs> uh, highlighted here um, is um, the sub-Saharan African region as well as um, East and, and South Asia, India and China both factor in there. So um, I'll zoom in now on a few particular regions and a few uh, aspects of this poverty, um, this poverty index to, to highlight um, some of the countries and particular regions of greatest concern from, um, from a poverty perspective projecting forward to 2030. And what we've also done here is to combine this information, to combine this index with the um, hazard uh, index information that we've developed from climate extremes, exposure to climate extremes and disasters. So this map um, requires a little bit of interpretation. Um, what you have um, in terms of the, the color schematic is you have individual countries' exposure to hazards. Now this is the five hazards that we've indicated uh, previously, so it, it includes not just climate extremes but also disasters. Um, which, is, which is part of the reason for explaining why particular regions um, that are exposed to drought in particular are not highlighted, such as, such as areas of sub-Saharan Africa. And the circles are representing um, the values of the index, the poverty index that we've identified. So larger circles suggest a higher number of, uh, of people in poverty in 2030, or um, the largest circle is representing a higher proportion of people in, in <coughs> severe poverty. And as the circles get smaller, it's uh, um, suggesting a smaller uh, value of our poverty index. So from this, uh, from this analysis, where we're now combining not just uh, our poverty uh, projections, uh, our hazard projections, but also looking at disaster risk management capacities, we've identified a few categories of country which, um, which would need to be considered uh, looking forward based on these three, uh, these three factors. So first, we have 11 countries that have high absolute numbers in poverty, as well as having a high multi-hazard exposure and have been identified based on, on our categorization of having inadequate capacity to minimize the impacts of a disaster. So this produces a list of 11 countries, which you see there, Bangladesh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Kenya, Madagascar, Nepal, Nigeria, Pakistan, South Sudan, Sudan, and Uganda. Um, moving next to um, a few countries that don't factor highly on exposure to hazards, uh, par particularly because of the individual hazards that they're exposed to. Um, they're not highlighted <coughs> from our uh, multi-hazard index, which includes all five factors, but who, ha who are also um, um, relatively exposed um, in the future uh, projections to high poverty levels, but also having uh, low levels of uh, capacity for disaster risk management. We highlight Niger, Somalia, and Yemen um, to, to consider on, on, a, on this list. 
Then uh, moving to another list of 10 countries, and these are countries that have high proportions of people in poverty, so separate from, from the first list, which was high numbers. Um, and these countries also have um, a high multi-hazard exposure and have also been identified from our analysis to have inadequate capacity to minimize the impacts of a disaster. Um, these are largely concentrated in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is Benin, Central African Republic, Chad, Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Haiti, Liberia, Mali, North Korea, and Zimbabwe. And then finally, um, in terms of our co combined analysis, we, uh, as, as Tom has highlighted, we've India represents a special case, um, in particular because um, this is where the highest numbers of people are projected to still remain in poverty in 2030. Um, and also, um, India has been uh, has been found from our disaster uh, and climate extremes analysis to have some of the highest exposure. And yet, this, the central capacity to manage disaster risk. Um, C can be um, quite effective, as we notice in recent events. Uh, but of course, we need to treat uh, India as um, as a cluster of separate subnational entities, and with some uh, states of particular concern. Looking forward, so um, just to just to um, highlight sort of the total figures that we've come up with, um, projecting forwards to 2030. Um, based on our baseline scenario, um, you can see. Um, different breakdowns of a poverty line, which could suggest different uh, severities of poverty uh, looking <coughs> forward to 2030. So the, the figure we highlight is, is $1.25 a day, and the projection that upwards of 325 uh, million people remain in poverty um, based on, on this measure. And we can also see that um, in, in, in this baseline scenario, below $4 a day, still 2 billion people uh, remaining in poverty in 2030. But now, the geographical distribution of this is uh, predominantly based in, in Asia, uh, based on um, the multi-hazard index. We can also look to uh, the optimistic scenario. Um, and so we're looking at the top 49 countries exposed to multi-hazards, looking forward to 2030. Um, and here we see slightly reduced numbers based on this optimistic scenario. But again, um, even with, with each of these factors that we've identified as drivers, um, in reducing the impacts of, of impoverishment, um, still we have uh, 178 million people globally living on less than $1.25 a day. And finally, we wanted to highlight, um, uh, as we've mentioned, that um, particular hazards have been identified as, uh, as, as leading to, um, as potentially leading to impoverishment, as was highlighted in the uh, studies of uh, Andhra Pradesh and Ethiopia. And so we've separated out the, the climate extremes from, from the uh, environmental models to look at drought, floods, and extreme heat temperatures. And this gives us a different list of countries. If we're only looking at these climate uh, factors, we have a list of 45 countries, which are um, largely concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa that are most exposed um, and also have the highest numbers of of poverty looking forward to 2030. So just looking at these three indicators, we still estimated a baseline level 319 million people globally um, in poverty in 2030, of which um, over half is in Asia, but the, the remainder, um, just under half, um, would be found in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, not quite done yet. Oh, I'm sorry. We've got some conclusions. Oh, good. <laughs> good. <laughs> looking forward to them. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Just very quickly to oh, very quickly to pick up here um, a set of recommendations coming out of this this study. Um, so we've arrived at this list of uh, countries that we think are of greatest concern. Uh, we've highlighted that uh, disasters can be a key factor in, in causing long-term impoverishment, and we've highlighted that there really is a strong geographic overlap between hazard exposure and residual poverty in 2030 and inadequate capacity to manage disaster risk. So what do we do about it? Well, if the international target that, we, that we're aiming for through the post-2015 goals is to end extreme poverty, then we've got to get DRR right. We've got to get DRR focused on the poorest people, um, and within the successor framework to the Hyogo framework for action, we've got to recognize this interplay between poverty and extreme risk. The problem that we've got at the moment, though, is in the analysis that we did in a set of five countries in more greater detail about disaster risk management efforts, is in all of those cases, they were not targeted on the poorest areas, uh, and they did not have aspects to them that were particularly focused on protecting the poorest people. 
Um, instead, they were probably more focused on high asset areas, uh, capital cities, infrastructure components, um, all were predominantly focused around uh, early warning systems and evacuations. And I think if we're serious about reducing disaster-induced impoverishment, we need to change the way that we're doing disaster risk management, certainly at scale, because we're, we're, not, we're not targeting uh, the poorest at the moment. We also found, by way of conclusion, that if you look at international finance for disaster risk management in our countries of concern, if you exclude Bangladesh, which is a real outlier, we've been providing, the international community has been providing just less than $2 million <coughs> per year for disaster prevention and risk reduction to those set of countries uh, individually. Um, so we're really, you know, this, this level of investment is tiny compared to uh, the need to, to, you know, the investments that are going to reducing poverty. That balance needs to shift. Um, at country level, we need to make disastrous management a cornerstone of poverty reduction efforts that would uh, mirror the international uh, focus that we would have through the post-2015 goals if these were combined. Uh, we need to uh, retarget our efforts on particular regions of exposure with high, high numbers of poverty by combining mapping that we have around disaster risk with mapping around poverty to make sure that they're overlaid. We need to focus on protecting livelihoods and protecting impoverishment. Uh, and we need to uh, reinforce with governments that if extreme poverty is going to be eliminated, then we've got to look as much about people slipping into poverty as we have on poverty escapes. Uh, I think we've also highlighted through this report that you know, the data sets that we're drawing on here are not the most comprehensive in the world and uh, we, we need to do uh, more work to bottom this problem out and to understand more about it. So certainly it would be good to do more household uh, survey assessments of the causes of impoverishment, how disasters stack up in that, and what's the characteristic of those particular households falling into poverty after disasters. We need to do more about that, and the, the data is really quite thin on that for now. Um, I think we also need to assess whether or not there is some kind of threshold, potentially an income <coughs> threshold, but it could also be a threshold related to education or nutrition, beyond which the chances of slipping back into poverty when a disaster strikes are greatly diminished. So could it be that $4 a day, for example, represents a level by which that you, know, you could think of some kind of threshold beyond which people would not slip back into poverty? And that might be because there's access to insurance or financial credit of some kind, or there's ability to draw on other assets or access, uh, be, be mobile. Um, but I think we can theorize that there may be some kind of threshold beyond which people will not slip back in. Um, and uh, we need to do more work to look at the, the data on that. I think we also need to recognize that many of the poverty models we have assume a linear progress. Uh, and actually what we know is that particularly when disasters strike or other types of shocks, progress on poverty reduction is not linear. Uh, and if we look on a country by country basis to 2030, we can surely find countries that are going to really slip back quite substantially. Uh, over that period. Maybe not all in aggregate, but some countries. So we need to understand that kind of different dynamic of poverty and, and, and uh, how, it, how it happens in some kind of cyclical manner. I think we need to look harder at sub-national disaster risk management capacity. Can we begin to get some measure of local government capacity to deal with disaster risk and adaptive capacity? There's been some work on that, but certainly the ability to track that globally is, is pretty th slim. Um, and we certainly do need, to need to do more to understand the interplay between drought, extremes of rainfall, and poverty. Uh, I don't think we've got there yet in terms of, of how we're combining the data, but I think we're, we're confident that we can make some headway in that regard. What I would say here is that, you know, in the, in the disasters field, we tended to be quite focused on the number of people killed uh, by disasters and the amount of economic losses. That's what you tend to find as the headlines. I think if we're going to be serious about this ending extreme poverty goal, we've got to shift that. We've got to do that, and we've got to also look at the number of people being impoverished by disasters and use that as a headline metric. And, of course, you know, we tend to have a, an international financing system for humanitarian action which follows the deaths. The larger number of deaths, the more money you tend to get. Um, what we need to do is change that around and say, actually, 
more money goes to areas the greater the impoverishment risk caused by disasters and switch that round. I think if we focus on that, we begin to make some headway in bringing these issues together. Thank you very much.